Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. I don't know what it is about these radiation incident reports, but I keep reading them even though I know they're going to gross me out. There's something about what radiation exposure does to the human body that I find fascinating and disgusting at the same time. Here's yet another horrifying radiological accident, the Yanango Incident. This incident happened on the 20th of February 1999 at the Yanango Hydroelectric Power Plant in Peru. There was a section of pipe that was in urgent need of repairs. The repair work involved welders fixing the damaged section of pipe, then a radiographer coming in to assess the weld to see if it needed any further repairs. The radiographers were contracted in from a company licensed to handle radioactive material. They use a device similar to a camera that uses radiation to examine the internal structure of something without having to disassemble it. It's a bit like an x-ray except it uses gamma rays. Inside this particular radiography camera was the radioactive source, in this case an Iridium-192 radioisotope mounted in a stainless steel pigtail cable. The plan was for the welders to repair the pipe in the morning, then while they were on their lunch break the radiographers would come in and scan the pipe with their camera. So at 11.30am the radiograph equipment was brought in and set up near to the pipe, ready to be used as soon as the welders caught their lunch break. However, by lunchtime the welders still weren't finished so the radiographers went away, leaving the equipment unattended. At 2pm the welders came back from lunch and they resumed their repair work. At around 4pm one of the welders found a short braid of metal wire on the ground. He picked it up and placed it into the back right pocket of his jeans. Then he climbed inside the pipe and resumed welding. As you can probably guess, this metal braid was the radioactive pigtail that should have been inside the camera. It's never been ascertained how this radioactive source got removed from the camera in the first place. Either it was some sort of negligence on the part of the radiographers setting up the equipment incorrectly, or it was deliberate tampering from the welders or some other worker at the power plants. It seems that, given the events that followed this, nobody wants to admit fault. The welder continued working late into the night, sat inside the 2 meter pipe with the pigtail in his back pocket the whole time. At around 9pm he began to feel a pain in his right thigh just below the buttock, but he continued working for another hour. At 10pm he finished work and caught a minibus, arriving home half an hour later. He complained to his wife about the pain in his thigh and when he pulled down his jeans she noticed a red mark just below his right buttock. He then took off his jeans and placed them on the floor and went to visit the local doctor. Whilst he was at the doctor's, the welder's wife back at home spent about 10 minutes sitting on the welder's discarded jeans breastfeeding their 18 month old child. The welder returned to the house about half an hour later, having been told by the doctor that the red mark was an insect bite. However, he remembered the strange metal wire that he'd picked up at work and started to wonder if that might have caused the pain. He removed the pigtail from his jeans and carried it to an outdoor bathroom about 4 meters away from the house. Back at the Yanango hydroelectric power plant, the radiographers had set up their camera as soon as the welders left at 10pm. Their first few attempts to use the camera failed to develop any images and their survey meter showed no radiation emitting from the device. They decided to leave the slides for a bit longer to see if anything developed and they took a break at about 10.30 to get some food, returning to the site at midnight. The slides were still undeveloped and they couldn't seem to get the camera to work. Then one of the radiographers noticed that the lock on the device was loose and when he looked inside, the radioactive source was missing. A large search was undertaken with extra people brought in from the radiography company to help track down the missing pigtail. 
They began visiting everyone who had worked on the site that day, eventually reaching the welder's house at 1am. The welder came to the door holding the pigtail in his bare hands and he was told to throw it out onto the street. At this point somebody put a large stone on top of the pigtail until specialist equipment could be brought in to safely recover it. The welder was immediately transferred to the National Cancer Center in Lima. Within a few days, the red mark on his thigh had become a large, painful blister. By the 26th of February, six days after his exposure to the radiation, his right thigh had become extremely swollen, as you can see on these CT scan images. By March, the blister had become a large patch of decaying flesh, the necrosis spreading outwards and the top layer of skin peeling off, leaving a weeping layer of subcutaneous skin exposed. The patient was in severe pain and he was unable to move from his bed, spending most of his day lying on his left hand side. By the 30th of March, the patient developed a high fever and the wound on his leg was found to be infected with Klebsiella and Streptococcus bacteria. By the 27th of April, the necrosis had spread across most of his upper right thigh. He was taken to the operating theatre and the rotten flesh was cut away, revealing that it had penetrated several layers of muscle tissue. They also found signs of radiation damage to the sciatic nerve. This being the largest nerve in the human body, the patient would have been in constant agony by this point. 3rd of May 1999, very large necrotic lesion extended in the upper third of the right thigh. The depth of the lesion was significant and most of it was covered by a crust and super infected. The edges of the necrotic lesion were well defined and were surrounded by a wide, depigmented halo. In the culture of the exudate from the operation wound, Klebsiella and Streptococcus were detected. 21st of May 1999 Worsening of the lesion of the sciatic nerve was found, which caused chronic and progressive suffering. At this point the infection was so severe that he was given triple antibiotic therapy and any further surgery was postponed because of the risk of septic shock. On the 28th of May he was taken to the Percy Military Hospital in France. If you watched my video about the Nguri forest incident you might remember this. It was the same hospital that the three men from Georgia were taken to after they spent that night warming themselves on some mysteriously hot piece of metal that they found in the woods. Surgical exploration on the 1st of June showed that the flesh on his right thigh had decayed all the way down to the femur and it was infected with bacteria that was resistant to the antibiotics they were giving him. The sciatic nerve was exposed and ulcerated, causing pain so great that the patient had to be given constant doses of ketamine and morphine. Amputation of the leg was discussed, but in order to try and save the limb, they instead attempted to cut away the necrotic tissue and treat the infection. However, by the 16th of August, it was found that the necrosis was spreading into the hip, which meant that the leg had to be amputated. The amputation was successful and the patient started to recover. Unfortunately, a month after the amputation, the stump became extremely sore. When doctors examined the patient, they found that the necrosis had spread to his perineum. He was taken into surgery once again, and this time his anal sphincter and part of his scrotum were sliced off. As you can imagine, the welder was pretty fucked up at this point, both physically and mentally. As well as being in severe pain, he'd lost tons of weight and was experiencing severe depression. With the infection spreading to his crotch, there was a high chance that it would soon reach his internal organs and if this happened, he would probably die. The French doctors decided it was best to send him back to Peru to be with his family. Back in Peru, the welder's condition continued to worsen with the necrosis of his perineum spreading outwards over his buttocks. They then became infected and left part of his pelvic bone exposed to the air. Necrotic lesions also started to appear on his left leg. 
I'll put a link to the report in the description. Just scroll down near the bottom. There's some pictures of his infected perineum. Take a look at that because I definitely can't show it in this video. Now, despite his critical condition, the report states that the close contact with his family proved to be a tremendous psychological factor in his survival. The report ends saying, June 2000, plastic reconstructive and urological surgery for the patient was considered. And there's no further mention of his condition in the report, but it was published in August of 2000, so it wasn't long after his stay in hospital. It also doesn't mention his name, so I can't find out much more information about him. There is, however, a photo of the same man taken 13 years after the incident, which means he lived at least until 2012. And I can't show those pictures either, sorry. As for the welder's wife, who had sat on the jeans for about 10 minutes, she did develop a lesion on her back, but she'd received a much smaller dose of radiation, so she recovered fairly quickly without any lasting damage. And luckily nobody else in the household or any of his co-workers had been exposed long enough to cause any further damage. And so, as promised, there's yet another horrific radiation story. I think this is the third one I've done on the channel, and they're all quite similar, I suppose. Somebody gets exposed to radiation, their skin starts to fall off, a bad time is had by all, but for some reason I still find them interesting enough to want to make a video out of. I don't think there's any real lesson to take away from this story unless by some weird chance you work for an industrial radiographer and then maybe it'll reinforce the need to keep your material secure in case somebody accidentally picks it up and irradiates their arse cheek. His recovery is pretty heroic considering the condition he was in. So, thank you for watching, I hope you found it interesting. Big thanks to everyone who is supporting the channel, thank you very much to all of you. Here's some more videos you might find interesting, and check them out if you want more like this, otherwise I'll probably appear in your recommended videos now that you've told YouTube that this is the kind of weird shit you like to see. Alright, until next time, goodbye.